Today's shiur is called Heaven in a Day or A Day in Heaven. It is a part three in the series of examining the holiness of the Shabbat. So we discussed on the first shiur the significance of why Shabbat is ma'en holam haba, why Shabbat is considered akin to the world to come. And we mentioned then the reason why it is akin to the world to come is because it is a greater intimacy with God on the Shabbat than it is during the weekday. And very briefly, during the six days of the week, God created the world through dibur, through speech. By Yomer Elohim Yehi Or, God said, let there be light, etc., etc. So very briefly, just to recap, the concept of speech refers to a particular type of revelation. Iov says, Umi basari haza eloka, from my flesh I will perceive God. By understanding ourselves, we can understand how God relates to humanity, how God relates to the world, and how God created the world um, to a certain degree. Speech is a revelation of self, but it is not the greatest part of who we are. It is a part of us that interacts and associates and creates a relationship with someone outside of me. It is somewhat of a revelation, but it is a very deep concealment of my inner thoughts and my inner emotions. I can never express to you what I'm thinking and what I'm speaking. My thoughts are much faster, much deeper than what I'm able to express. One time, the Holy Arizal soul was uplifted to the highest realms, and one of his students saw that he was in a deep trance, in a deep state of meditation, and when he awoke from that state of meditation, he asked him, his student asked him, what is it that you saw? And he said that I was uplifted to very high palaces in heaven where great revelations was revealed to me, spiritual Kabbalistic revelations. So he said, could you please reveal it to me? And he said that if I was to speak for 80 years, non-stop, straight for 80 years, I would not be able to reveal to you the slightest, slightest of that re- smallest um, part of that revelation that was revealed to me. When a person experiences something in the subconscious, then even thought is limiting. When a person experiences something of the soul, a revelation of the soul, even thought is limiting. When a person experiences a thought or an emotion, then speech is very limiting. Shabbat, how does the world continue to exist? It exists through a deeper revelation of God. That is a revelation of thought much more intimate. And for this reason, Shabbat is considered akin to the world to come. Because the world to come is a deeper dimension of revelation of godliness that the world cannot yet handle as of yet. For this reason, the Midrash tells us that from the moment that Adam was created, which was Friday, from the Friday um, uh, day, when it was became day on Friday morning, until the end of Shabbat, until Motzei Shabbat, there were 36 hours. During those 36 hours, darkness did not descend. Why? Because the concept of light is systemic about, of what, of a symbolic of what Shabbat is all about, light. Because light is a symbol in Kabbalistic lexicon of godliness and spirituality. It's the best example that we can find because light is similar to the um, ma'or. Or is me'en ha-ma'or. The light is similar to the ma'or, to the source of light. Sun, and if we were to take sun, and if we take the light that emanates from the sun, it is very similar to the sun because it's an extraction, it's an, a, it's an expansion of the light, it's an extension of the light of the sun. So that's why the Kabbalists like to use light as a symbol 
of spirituality, a symbol of godly revelation. And many reasons which we don't have the time, we discussed on other occasions as well. For this reason, as a symbolism of this, night or darkness did not descend on the Shabbat at all. And that's the reason why we, on Motzei Shabbat, we light the, uh, the, the light. Because during the whole Shabbat, Adam did not need a light. It was fully, fully uh, illuminated. Because light is a symbol of godly revelation. The revelation that existed on Shabbat was much greater than the other six days of the week. As we spoke about last week and as we're going to speak about a bit more. And as we spoke about in the first week, the concept of speech is a much more limiting revelation of what I'm thinking. So Shabbat is, is, is where we become intimate with God. It's like that the king, so to speak, comes to you. And for this reason on Shabbat, we're not permitted to do melacha, we're not permitted to do mundane activities, both as a commemoration that God desisted from mundane activities or creative activities, but even greater because it's a revelation of godliness, it's much more intimate. And for this reason, when we stand before the king, we don't do mundane activities. It's a greater revelation on Shabbat. During the weekday, the king, so to speak, is hidden within the realm of nature. And as we discussed on many occasions, the word hateva in Hebrew is the exact same numerical value as Elohim, which is the name that is associated with creation and concealment. The concealment of godliness within nature. So during the six days of the week, we take godliness for granted as he is disguised in the veil of nature. But on Shabbat, he who wants to can feel the king because the revelation is much more greater and thus one can build a much more intimate relationship with God on that day. And for this reason, it is akin to the world to come because that's what the whole world to come is all about. The revelation of godliness where there is no longer any concept of impurity. And this is why, we mentioned this a little bit before and we'll mention it again. On Shabbat, one is permitted, not only permitted, encouraged and commanded to have a lavish meal and to associate oneself with the material and the physical, even though during the weekday we are not encouraged to overindulge. Just eat what you need to eat, what you need to exist. doesn't mean to say that you cannot enjoy the food that you eat. You don't specifically have to eat. If you, if you, if you don't like curry, you don't command it to eat curry during the six days of the week. You like curry, you can eat it, but don't invest your whole soul, your whole being in the materialism. Because on, during the weekday, because there is a lesser revelation of godliness, we are less empowered to elevate things. On Shabbat, since... Shabbat is a great revelation of godliness. We are much more empowered to elevate things and thus we are encouraged to participate in the material world. A similar example of this, for example, we find that gold was used for a negative thing. The, 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 the Almighty blessed the Jewish people that they came out of Egypt with great abundant wealth. And unfortunately, that gold, that wealth was used to create a golden calf. So we see that when we engage too much in the material world, for this reason, there would, uh, people would be, the, 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 the pious people would be quite frightened of wealth. Because wealth, with wealth comes a greater um, trial, a greater tribulation. When a person is uh, bereft of wealth, when a person has to look up to God for every morsel, for, the ne- for his very next meal, he's much more humble. He's, he realizes his dependency upon God. The wealthy person who's got much in the bank thinks that he's got much in the bank. He, so to speak, doesn't need God. Or doesn't turn to God as much as he should. There was a great rabbi who one of his disciples wanted to support him. And the rabbi refused. That's probably why his disciple wanted to support him. And he said, no, no, thank you very much. I very much enjoy turning to God every single day for my meal. And every single day he answers my prayers. If I were to be supported by you, then I would feel so comfortable 
that I would not feel any, any more the necessity, the need to turn to God for my daily portion, and I could, God forbid, subtly forget God. So sometimes when we engage too much in the material world, we can sometimes forget God. For this reason, the pious ones were afraid of wealth, lest we forget God. The poor person is humble. He's got a daily reminder of his humility. He's got a daily reminder of his dependence upon God. We, a wealthy person, notice how I said the uh, Freudian slip, we. (laughs) We, a wealthy person, could God forbid grow so complacent that he, um, that he could mistake his dependency upon God. And the truth is, like I always say, a person in hospital and a person who's walking in the street, the person who's healthy and fit and walking in the street, is no less dependent upon God than someone who's sitting in hospital. The only difference is, is the guy in the hospital knows it, and the guy on the street forgets it. And so too the wealthy person. He forgets it. The GFC has proven to many of us how easily people um, have saved their whole life savings and it goes in a second. Or we thought that we had life savings, but for many years we were fooled and we never had any life savings. Those life savings long ago went. And we don't need to remind everybody of the the tragedy of, of individuals who took advantage of others. So therefore, the Jewish people came out of Egypt. They had abundant wealth and sometimes we don't know what to do with it and we sin. And they created the golden calf. But when they did a very deep repentance, they took the same items that could be the cause of sin, the gold, and they used it in the temple. Because the temple, there is no room for mistake. Because the revelation of God was so great and so deep, there was no room for error, there was no room for sin. Same in Shabbat. During the weekday, we are warned, don't be overindulgent. During Shabbat, we are encouraged to utilize the material thing, to honor the Shabbat. Because if you only seek and only want to, we can feel a tremendous, tremendous intimacy with God on Shabbat. And no longer does the material world become an impediment to us. During the weekday it is. It is a cause of concealment, the the, the world, the material world. On Shabbat it's not a cause of concealment because God's thought is more revealed as opposed to God's speech. This is all metaphor, of course. It's different levels. It refers to a level. Just like speech is higher and more intimate within us, sorry, just like intellect, thought is much more intimate and close to us, more so than speech. Then when it says God created the world through speech, it refers to a lower revelation or a lower intimate relationship with him. In, in contradistinction, for example, when he created man. When he created man, it was a totally different. He didn't say, let there be man. What does it say? Hashem <laughs> elokim God formed man from the dust of the, of the earth. And then it says, And he blew within his nostrils the breath of life. Blew within his nostrils the breath of life. Take a soul, put it in him, and that's the end of that. Why does it say, These are all human metaphors that we use to describe the way God created the world or the way God created man. Why do we use that metaphor? Because... Again, if we look at ourselves and we see how we work, we will understand what type of revelation God revealed himself when he formed man. What type of revelation was that? Deeper, deeper than the creation of the world. How so? It says in the Zohar, Man the nafach, he who blows, mitochia nafach, he blows from him his innards. Different from speech, I don't get tired from speaking, I can speak and speak and speak. But if I were to blow and to blow a balloon, it comes from my innards. So too, when God blew the breath of life in man, he does not use the terminology, he said, let there be man. Why? Because there's a deeper connection, there's a deeper revelation when he created man. One that is more intimate, one that is more inner, an inner part of God. And that is why it says, the expression, he blew within him, just like he who blows, blows from, from right over here. 
from his innards, from his core, so too, so to speak, metaphorically, the soul comes from the inner part of God as opposed to the body. But Yitzhak, he formed like he would to form anything else. Therefore, Shabbat was symbolic of this revelation, and we see it expressed in the fact that for 36 hours there was light until Motzei Shabbat. So there was no night after the regular time span, the 12 hours of day, you've got to have night, and then you have the, the 6 hours of night, and then you have day, and etc., etc. Here it wasn't so. 36. What is the numerical value of 36? We call this mispar katan. Single, um, single digits. Single digits is we take the, the two digits, or three digits or four digits, and we count them and see what comes up. To, and, we, and we break them down to a single digit. So three and six equals? Nine. Or... The numerical value of Or is 207. Aleph. The numerical value of the letter Aleph is 1. The letter Vav is 6. The letter 200. Uh, Reish is 200. So altogether is 207. Break it down to single digits. What do you get? 9. Hesed, which is kindness, which is the essence of the revelation of godliness. Kindness. Because as it says in Kabbalah, that uh, God wants to bestow His kindness upon us. And that's the essence of creation. Revelation and kindness are as, as synonymous one with the other, as opposed to um, holding back or constricting revelation or concealing revelation. That comes from the attribute of gvura, of God's justice, of God's strength, where you hold back, where you conceal. Revelation is always associated with love, associated with kindness. The numerical value of hesed is, het is 8, samech is 60, dalet is 4, altogether equals 72. What's the single digit of 72? 9. Let's go to Shabbat. What's the numerical value of Shabbat? Shin is 300, bet is 2, taf is 400, altogether 702. Single digit, 9. Emet, emet, truth, truth, something is truth, means there's no concealment. This is the essence, this is the core, this is the truth. What's the numerical value of truth? Aleph is 1, Mem is 40, Taf is 400, 4 for 1, single digit, 9. We'll get to this one in a minute, which also happens to be 9. Kedem, Kedem means something that was before, is 144, Kuf is 100, Dalet is 4, Mem is 40, 144, also equals 9. It is known, and we gave a whole shiur on it once, that the number that symbolizes truth is the number 9. Why is that? Because you multiply 9 by any number, will always end up to be in single digit 9. Anyone good in maths here? 12 times 9. I don't know, you should be good at maths. No? 108. 8 plus 1 equals? Come on, let's be adventurous. 20 times 9. Come on, what's that? 180. 9. Any times 9, you times it by anything, will always single digit be, look, come back to itself. Which means, what is emet? Emet is something that is consistent. Something that is absolute. Something that is always the same. The only thing that is the same is godliness. We change. You put a seed, it grows, becomes a sapling, becomes a this, becomes a bush, becomes a shrub, becomes a tree, becomes that, dies. We're born, we don't have teeth. Then we grow older. And then we get teeth. And we grow older again. We get hair. We grow older again, we lose hair. We grow older again, we lose the teeth. We change all the time. <laughs> the only thing that doesn't change is God's truth. Because it's absolute, it's true. If you notice that all of the above share the same 
number, the number of truth, Shabbat. Because Shabbat is the essence of the purpose of creation as we will soon see because it is, in, in essence, it's revelation of God. Concealment is not truth. It, it conceals godliness. Dibur, speech, is really not absolute truth because it conceals godliness. It's not the way things are really truly are. Nature conceals godliness. But revelation, which is or, hesed, which is God's kindness, Shabbat, all equal the number nine. And for this reason, there was 36 hours of light, of or, which is the same numerical value as nine, during the whole of Shabbat. Because it is the symbol of God's truth, God's light, God's kindness, God's revelation. This is akin to the world to come, which it says, There will be no longer any death, because death itself is not a natural existence. Death is concealment. It's a concealment of life. It's something that ought not, not, ought not to be. And when there will be a revelation, when there will no longer be the concept of sin, and there's no reason for there to be impurity in the world, forgetfulness, sickness, or death, will be removed, will be banished. Where there is revelation, as we discussed on, a, on, pre, on last week, there is no room for error. There is no room to sin. That is why on Shabbat, if someone really wants to attach himself to the Shabbat and cleave to the Shabbat, less likely to sin. And that is why on Shabbat, not only are we permitted, but we are encouraged to involve ourselves in the material world by dressing beautifully, by eating beautiful foods and drinking fine wines, etc., etc., and even resting. Having said this, I want to read to you something very interesting from a book called Shem Mishmuel. It's a very, very profound and beautiful book, which I enjoy studying from often, and I often quote. Hine Shabbat, Behold, the Shabbat is the completeness and the essence, the energy behind all of creation. Similarly, when God created man, which man is the epoch of all creation, of all the creatures, Shabbat is the epoch of all the days of creation, as we will soon see. When God created man, what does it say? Vayitzer Hashem Elokim et Adam Afar Min Adama. God formed man from the dust of the earth. Vaharkach, and afterwards it says, Vayipah Ba'apav Nishmat Haim. And only afterwards did He place, did He blow within Him the breath of life, His soul, which means that first comes the lower dimension as a preparation to the higher dimension. Kenaya Bichlal Abriya. So too was with. Generally, the whole concept of creation. Shahar shenishlam hakol. After everything was completed, ba Shabbat. Only then did Shabbat come. Shehi nishmat abriya. Just like man has a body and has a soul, Shabbat is the soul of creation. Now we understand this a little bit better because the soul of creation, the soul means something a deeper, deeper something that, that that is deep within us. It is that which energizes us, the soul. So to what energizes the world is the Shabbat. It's the neshama of the world. The neshama of creation. I want to quote from you something very interesting from Lecha Dodi. Lecha Dodi is a beautiful song about the Shabbat. But before I do, I want to tell you a very interesting story. One time there was a rabbi who saw a stranger in the synagogue. And after the service, he invited him to his house for Shabbat, for the meal. During the meal, the gentleman, which um, 
was very intrigued with the whole Shabbat and everything that took place, and he was mesmerized by the prayers, asked the rabbi, you know, you sang a beautiful song during the service. Can you sing it to me again? And he sang it to him again. And he said, well, what song is this? And he says, this is the L'Chadodi song. This is the song that we sing when we welcome the Shabbat. And he loved the song so much, he asked the rabbi to sing it again. Can you please sing it again? And he sang the song again. Later on, they were talking between the, you know, the, the meal, between the courses. And uh, the rabbi asked him, where are you from? He says, I'm from, I'm from Aza, I'm from Gaza. <laughs> the rabbis usually have uh, many surprises and many shocks, but this was, would have taken the cake. So he says, what, uh, are you serious? He says, yeah, I'm Palestinian. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> he says, but I want to tell you something. I came to the synagogue because before my mother died, she told me that in fact she's Jewish. And unfortunately, she married a Muslim, and she moved into the towns of the Muslims, and she, of course, there had to hide her Jewish origin. But before she died, she told me that I am Jewish. And in fact, not only are we Jewish, but we are descendants from a great rabbi named Rabbi Shlomo Alkabatz. The rabbi's face thought he had a surprise before... He even had a greater surprise now. He has a guy who tells him he's from Aza. And he tells him he's Palestinian. Then he tells him he's Jewish. Then he tells him he's in fact related to Rabbi Shlomo al Who is this Rabbi Shlomo al Rabbi Shlomo al lived about 500 years ago. He was the teacher of the great Kabbalist Rabbi Moshe Kodovero. And he was the author of the poem Lecha Dodi that that particular individual was so mesmerized when they sang it in the synagogue and they sang it in the house. He didn't even know why. His great-great-great-grandfather was the one that authored that very song. No wonder his soul was touched by it. So I want to tell you something very interesting which this Kabbalist embedded in his song. Quite often we take prayers for granted. I tell this to my kids. You know, you have to really appreciate the prayers and really tap into the words because every word is precious and has very deep meaning. And if we don't merit to know all of the means, at least tap into the energy of each word and understand and be excited by the fact that you are reciting words that are very holy and very deep, even if you don't understand them. But know that they are electric, know that they are very deep. Rabbi Shlomo al Kabatz wrote in his Lecha Dodi, a very interesting thing. He says, Lecha, Likrat Shabbat, Lechu Elcha. Towards the Shabbat, let us go and greet. Kihi mekor haberacha, because Shabbat is the mekor, is the source of all blessing. As it says in the Zohar, that Shabbat, mineimit barechin kul hoyamin, all of the days of the week gets blessed from the Shabbat. For when you keep Shabbat properly, the whole week goes totally differently. So he writes, because it is the source of all blessing, just like the source of all of our blessing, our ability to communicate, our ability to love, our ability to give of ourselves, to be charitable. Where does it come from? Warmth. It comes from the soul. The soul is the source of all blessing. So to the Shabbat, which is the soul of all of creation, it is the source of all blessing. Mirosh mikedem Nesucha, from the very head, the very beginning. Kede means the beginning. It was already crowned. Sof ma'aseh, b'machshabat ehila, the end is always rooted in the first thought. So what was the end of creation? Sunday or Saturday or Shabbat? Shabbat. The 
Kabbalists teach us, and in fact it says this in Perek Mem Zayin, Tanya Perek, chapter 47, Tanya says, look, a person has to ponder in his prayers how lofty and how great and how infinite God is, and how God put himself totally aside in order to create us. He did something extraordinarily not normal, unnatural. He concealed himself. Godliness, by very definition, is revelation, is expansion. God concealed himself in order for there to be a world, in order for there to be a me and you, in order for us to partake of God's benevolence and kindness. And even the greatest and the highest of levels that are much greater than us as the Kabbalists teach us, in the most simplest form, we know that there are four worlds, general worlds, Atzilut, Bereya, Yetzirah, Asiyah, the world Atzilut, the world of emanation, is the highest world, where in that world is pure godliness. And then there was a world of creation, and then formation, and then the world of action, this world. So there was a, a process by which God continually concealed himself until he created this, this physical, mundane world. And of course, we think to ourselves and say, you know how lowly, how humble we are, and we are. We are nothing compared to the high levels that perceive and is revealed to them greater godliness and are aware of godliness. Yet God put into place all of that spiritual infrastructure, the highest levels to the lowest levels, and we are the bottom line. We are where the buck stops, so to speak. So we are the end result. That's rooted in the first thought because that's what God wanted. So there is an advantage. There is a quality Embedded in this material, physical world. That that's what God exactly wanted. That's rooted in His original will. Original will. When I want a house, a home, I want a home. So in order to facilitate the home, i got to get an architect, and i got to order the bricks, and i got to order the tiles, and i got to order the cement, and i got to order the taps, and i got to order the wood, the frame, the steel. And it's all delivered there, but that's not really what I want. What I want is when the house is completed and I have a home and I have a place where my children are no longer interested in the bricks and in the tiles where my children can can sit, where I can be who I want to be. This is what God wanted. A place where where He will be revealed down here below. So, so to the Shabbat. The Shabbat is rooted in the first thought. Because the Shabbat was the last day of the week, it must be rooted in the first thought, original thought, like a person's home. That's what he wanted. Not the bricks, not the tiles, not the taps. The end result is always reveals what the original thought was. Shabbat is the end result. So he writes, Mirosh Mikedem at the very beginning, the very head of the beginning. In other words, Mikedem. Shabbat was already crowned. What does it mean? It means that the very beginning of creation, the whole beginning of creation, Shabbat, is the purpose of it all. Let's see how this works. Kedem. What's the numerical value of Kedem? Kuf is 100. Dalet is 4. Mem is 40. 144. Which again, breaks down to the number 9. 4 plus 4 plus 1 equals 9. Now, how many hours are there in a day? How much? <laughs> right. Again, my dyslexia. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking so quick. I'm thinking already the next number, but I'm writing the next number before I... That's why, what happens. Thought is so much more faster than speech or action. How many days of the week are there prior to the Shabbat? So who's good at math? How many hours are there in the six days of the week totally? How many? How many? One four four. Got to get your maths right, Mashiko. One four four. So there are twenty four hours to the six days of the week. That's the numerical value of kedem. So Rabbi Shlomo Alkabet says, Mirosh mi kedem. Already the kedem, which is one hundred and forty four hours of the six days of the week that God created and, and, and formed. He already planned. Mirosh Mikedem. Nesucha was already crowned, was already crowned the Shabbat.
And this is seen in Parashat Behar. Parashat Behar, we find a very interesting thing. We find in Parashat Behar very opening of Parashat Behar. By Daber Hashem and Moshe Behar Sinai Lemor, and God spoke to Moshe and Mount Sinai, saying, Daber el Bene Israel, go and speak to the children of Israel, the Amarta el Hemen, and she'll tell them, Kitavo el Haaretz, when you will come to the land of Israel that God is giving us as an inheritance, Asher Anino Ten Lachem, which I give you, the Shavta Haaretz Shabbat la Hashem, and the land will cease. A Sabbath for Hashem, that is the sabbatical year, that is the Shemitah year, that is the year where we're not allowed to plow and sow and harvest and all of that stuff. Just like there's a Shabbat in days, there's a Shabbat in years. There's six years where we're allowed to plant and harvest, and since, since Eretz Israel is holy, it also has a Shabbat. Since the soul is holy, it also has a Shabbat. A Shabbat in days... There's also a Shabbat in weeks. When is that? The seven weeks that we count from going out of Egypt to Shavuot. The seven weeks. There's also a Shabbat in years, the sabbatical year. And without getting into the whole purpose of the sabbatical, we'll touch upon a little bit. But what's interesting to note is is that it says, when you come to the land, you shall celebrate, you shall keep the sabbatical, the Shemitah. The Rebbe of Lubavitch asks a very interesting question. The Jewish people did not keep the sabbatical year when they entered the land. When did they keep the sabbatical year? First of all, it took them Years, seven years to conquer and seven years to divide the land amongst the Jewish people. So 14 years it took them to properly establish themselves upon the land. And then and only then did they begin the count of the sabbatical. Only then was year one. Year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six. And then seven. Which means that there was 21 years. How many years? 14, 21 years. On the 21st year of them entering the land of Israel, did they commence the sabbatical? So why does the Torah say, Kitavo el ha'aretz, when you will come to the land, asher ani noten lachem that I have given you, v'shavta ha'aretz shabbat l'ashem, and the land will keep the Shabbat for Hashem. It wasn't till the 21st year. Why are you saying keep... The Rebbe says a very interesting thing. He says, because you should know and understand that the whole point and purpose of every day and of every year of you tilling the field is for the purpose of the sabbatical. It is the ultimate, it is the culmination of all of your years of conquering the land, of establishing yourselves on the land, of dividing the inheritance, the land amongst the 12 tribes of Israel. It is the ultimate. It is the, the epoch. Like Shabbat is the essence, is the soul of the weekday. So too the sabbatical is the soul of Eretz Israel, Because Eretz Israel is very holy and very special. Look what he says over here. It says over here that because the land of Israel is so holy and so special, the land of Israel is not just a land like all other lands. It has spiritual components and qualities to it. It too has a neshama, it too has a soul, and that is the Shemitah. 
That is the sabbatical. That is its Shabbat. And what happens on the Shemitah? You must reveal the neshama of the land. You must reveal the neshama of self. Why? Just like Shabbat, you must reveal the neshama of who you are. You know that intellect is the antenna or the frequency of the body. The body works and interacts with intellect. What is the antenna or the frequency of the soul? Emuna, belief. Why? Emuna is not something that is below intellect. Emuna is something that is beyond intellect, beyond the rationale. When you believe in something that is beyond the rationale, why is that? And how are you able to believe in something that is not clearly understood in your intellect? That is only when you reveal your soul. When you reveal your soul, it knows godliness, it feels godliness, because the soul is a part of godliness. And that's why intellect is quite limiting. It will only understand that which it can relate to in this world. But emunah is extremely powerful. It is beyond the rationals, beyond the intellect. What powers it? What generates it? The soul. They're interactive. They interact one with the other. Emunah comes from the soul. Intellect is from the body. It's from the brain. Intellect is very inhibiting. It's very limiting. In fact, it's very subjective. Quite often we will uh, rationalize things the way we want to. Emunah is where the soul is revealed and it seals godliness. Sees godliness. Shabbat is an expression of that soul. As we said before, Shabbat is the soul of creation, just like the soul of the human, of the body, is the neshama. Shabbat is this. Why? Because Shabbat, you're expressing an absolute faith, A, that God created the world, a belief, a declaration that God created the world, B, that He sustains us. I don't need to work on Shabbat. I don't work on Shabbat. Why don't I work on Shabbat? But I can earn more money on Shabbat. I can have more leisure. I can have more pleasure. I can have more wealth. Or for someone who's not wealthy at all. And at the turn of the, of the last century, those Jews who went to migrate to America had an extremely tough time in keeping Shabbat. Why? Because in those days, people worked on the Saturday. And rested on the Sunday. And if you didn't work on Saturday, if you didn't work on the Shabbat, you lost your job. There were countless and countless and countless of Jews who, un- who unfortunately worked from Monday to Friday. And Friday they lost their job. As soon as they said, okay, I have to leave and I'm not coming tomorrow. Oh, is that so? Don't come back at all. And every week they had to find another job. And they lived penniless. But those Jews who withstood the test, the children, the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren are around to tell the tale. A God-fearing Jews. There are many, countless unfortunately, who against their will could not withstand the test and it's a difficult test to see your children going without shoes or hungry or you have to rent something beneath standard, below normal standard, because you can't afford you renting a, a basement in the, in the bottom of a building because you can't afford a normal rent and it's difficult. And that's usually the area where they had the, the furnaces in those days. How did they heat the, the, the buildings they, with a furnace? I remember seeing those furnaces in, the, in New York. You used to have the furnaces there. You'd fire up the furnace. Anybody who was on that bottom level would get all the soot, not comfortable. So there were many who couldn't withstand the test and unfortunately worked on Shabbat. It's not, it's not, it wasn't an easy test at all. It was a great trial for many, many Jews. So therefore, he who keeps the Shabbat is such a powerful declaration of his faith in God, of his absolute connection of God, because he feels God. He knows God. It's not just in the realm of intellect, because sometimes we know something and we don't act upon what we know. But when you see God through your neshama, through your faith in God, it's unshakable. And that's what Shabbat is. So to Shemitah. You just got a beautiful plot of land. You spent thousands of dollars buying the tractor. 
you spend thousands of dollars buying the gra- the, the, the right uh, manure and the, the seeds. And the, comes the seventh year, bang, that's it. Whatever grows, you can eat, but you can't commercial, commercialize it, you can't sell it, you can't harvest it, you can, you can pick it and eat it like everybody else. Everybody is allowed, is welcome to come to your land like you and come and take what they want. For one whole year you can't grow. And you are to have faith. This whole year. One year is a big time. You are to have faith in God. That the produce. That you have. Will sustain you. And will enrich you. And enliven you. That's a tall ask. How do you achieve that? When you reveal the neshama. Of who you are. And also. You're respecting the land, not just like the botanists say. And by the way, one, one of the shurim that I spoke about, I, I quoted a botanist that says that the land only can produce six full years and then needs a rest. Otherwise it starts to, uh, to uh, I don't know what, uh, cause uh, rotting and, uh, and uh, acid in the soil and whatever. You've got to need it, need it to rest. So even the commandments of God are even physically to our benefit, as we know. But that's not what Shemitah really is all about. Shemitah is because it's like Shabbat. is the neshama of the land. And the neshama of the land is a revelation of God. As we said before, Shabbat is a revelation of God. And how is the revelation of God expressed? Through our faith in God. Through our absolute, unshakable faith in God. Whether it is keeping Shabbat and through its difficulties. Or whether honoring the Shabbat the way we meant to honor the Shabbat. I.e., Making the Shabbat a spiritual day. Not just a day where we take it easy, we rest, we have a beautiful meal, we go to sleep, and that's the end of that. Making it a spiritual day. <clears throat> or whether it is a sabbatical, the neshama of the land, that we have to express our faith in God, that He is the owner of the land, not us. He is the Baal Abayat. He is the owner of this world. And we have to express this every day. And this is expressed much, much more so on the Shabbat. Every year, and it's expressed much, much more so on the sabbatical year. Interesting to note, remember we said before, the very concept of Shabbat is embedded in the very first word of Bereshit. Because we said Bereshit is the letters of two words. Yira Shabbat. The awe or the respect of Shabbat. Bereshit. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha-adetz. Why did God create the heaven and earth? For Bereshit. What's Bereshit? We said last week. It's Yira Shabbat. The awe and the respect of Shabbat. That's the purpose of creation. Because by extension, as we learned before, it refers to the revelation of God. So Shabbat is a revelation of God. That's the purpose of creation. The God will be revealed in every aspect of creation in our psyche. And as we mentioned last week in the Shur, Shivita Hashem Nehagdita Midi Midata Tzadikim. I set God before me is the attribute of the righteous that every step that they take they are aware of God's presence. Shabbat is a revelation of God's presence. So too the Shemitah. The Shemitah, the sabbatical, is a revelation of God's presence. That we are aware that God reveals, that, that God is behind everything and is the essence and the energy behind everything. And that is the whole pur- purpose of creation. That's what's at Bereshit. Bara Elohim et HaShamayim et HaAretz. Now, if we take the word Bereshit, which is Yira Shabbat, right? So the word, very word Bereshit, as we, as we express, explained last week, is the awe of Shabbat. The very beginning of creation, the very purpose of creation is the respect of Shabbat. How many words do we have afterwards? Bara Elohim et Hashamayim ve'et Haaretz. We have exactly six words. There are seven words in the in the pasuk Bereshit. Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashamayim ve'et Haaretz is seven words. The word Bereshit hints to the Shabbat, so that's the seventh word. How many words do we have after the six six words? (laughs) 
just as this applies to the Shabbat, and the whole world works towards the Shabbat, and is a build-up towards the Shabbat. As it says, yamim kol During the six days of the week, you shall work and do and toil and do whatever you need to do. But on the Shabbat, Yishbot, you shall rest, you shall proclaim the Shabbat holy. So too, we know that God created the world for six millennium. And the seventh millennium is the Shabbat, is the global Shabbat, is the revelation of the Messianic redemption, of which a Messianic redemption could come any minute, could come millennium and, and years before. But it cannot be delayed more than that. The world will exist for six millenniums as we know it now. Worst comes to worst scenario. And the seventh millennium will be just like Shabbat is a revelation of godliness. The seventh millennium will be the Shabbat. And that's again a comparison between Shabbat and the world to come. And just as we must toil in the six days of the week to prepare ourselves, to purify ourselves for Shabbat as we will perhaps get a chance to see another occasion. So too must we work and toil during the times that we are in exile as a build-up to the revelation of the Messianic redemption. And that is the essence and the core. As we said in the the beginning, when you come to the land, you shall keep the Shabbat. It didn't happen until way later. So too, we're in exile. Revelation could happen any second now or could happen tomorrow or next year, God forbid, or, or 10 years from now, God forbid. But our psyche must be that our whole focus in life works towards revelation. Revelation that exists within the Shabbat. Revelation that exists within our Neshama, which is like the Shabbat. Revelation that will exist in the coming of Mashiach, which is the Shabbat of the world. And as it says, Misha Tarah Be'erev Shabbat, Yochal Be Shabbat, on Shabbat, you don't cook. Everything has to be prepared before Shabbat. He who toils before the Shabbat, prepares and honors and sanctifies beforehand the Shabbat, will, so to speak, partake the fruits of his toil on Shabbat. So too, we must prepare ourselves spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, physically for the Shabbat of the world, the global Shabbat, the coming of Mashiach speedily in a manner that we are prepared like we prepare for the Shabbat in order that we facilitate the revelation, just like we facilitate the Shabbat, when we honor the Shabbat, we cook for the Shabbat, and and we prepare for the Shabbat, we honor the Shabbat, and then on the Shabbat we feel its grandeur and its royalty. So too, when Mashiach comes, we have to prepare for that. How do we prepare for that? We'll soon see it's up to you whether you want to have another shear on this topic, because there's still a bit more to discuss. We prepare prepare for it by maintaining the whole six days... The, the psyche that works towards the Shabbat, that our whole existence towards Shabbat, and as we mentioned before, by extension, the concept of Shabbat is revelation of God. What is revelation of God? Revelation of God is an awareness of godliness, of God's presence. And if we are aware of God's presence, we are aware of Emet, which is the same Mispar Katan, small digit figure of Shabbat. That's nine, 702 is nine, 441 is nine which is all, which is revelation, 207, which is nine, which is hesed, which is God's kindness, 72, which is nine. We'll stop here for now.